Hello, my name is uh, Mariano Zaron. I'm the head of R&D at Mocex Intelligence. And today we're gonna to be talking about the computational challenge of IMA FRTB and solutions via Chebyshev Tensors. So before we get started, let me just quickly uh, or briefly tell you who we are or what Mocex Intelligence is. So Mocex Intelligence is a FinTech startup. It's been up and running for about three years and a half, and it mainly uh, focuses in the area of risk uh, analytics. And essentially what we are is just a bunch of people that like coming up with solutions uh, of a technical nature for specific business problems. And we like doing this within collaboration frameworks. So if there's anything that strikes you as interesting or relevant in this presentation, please do not hesitate to get in contact with us. We love hearing from you, uh, hear what the business problems that you're facing on a regular basis are, uh, so that we can think of possible solutions to these uh, business problems. Also, very encouraging for us is that we've been ranked one of the top three FinTech startups in risk analytics, which is, of course, great for us. And uh, just a quick comment before we get started is that the implementation of some of the methods presented here are patent protected. But uh, of course, if you're interested in implementing them, we're more than happy to give you a license for your own use. So please uh, do not get, uh, hesitate, get in touch with us because we don't want this to be uh, an issue at all. So let's jump straight into the contents of the presentation. First of all, we're gonna be talking about the pricing problem in risk calculations. So here we identify the problem that we have in our hands. Then we're gonna talk about Chebyshev tensors, which are gonna be the objects that we're gonna be using in order to tackle this problem. We'll give you a brief uh, description of the main mathematical properties that Chebyshev tensors have. And also we'll talk about how to use uh, Chebyshev tensors within risk engines. And finally, the last section will cover and um, present some results that we obtained within the systems of a tier one bank where we used Chebyshev tensors in order to tackle the pricing problem within the context of FR2B IMA. Let's go to uh, the pricing problem in risk calculations. So many of you I'm sure are familiar with uh, what this problem is about, but I'm just gonna be, I'm just gonna quickly cover it to set the scene and also to give ourselves an idea of the challenge that we have in our hands. So basically when you have a risk calculation, uh, you start by collecting a set of uh, risk scenarios. And these risk scenarios need to be priced by your pricing functions, which are within your pricing engines. So these are the pricing functions of your trades within your portfolios. And it is this step, the pricing step, which is computationally very expensive. And of course, it also has uh, economic implications for your organizations. Now, let me give you an example of one of these risk calculations that you need to do on a regular basis. Let's say CVA. Usually the risk scenarios for CVA are generated within a Monte Carlo simulation. So we're talking about uh, around 5,000 parts or 5,000 scenarios. It's just an order of magnitude I've seen much more in some places and 100 time steps into the future. So in this particular example, we're talking about half a million nodes within the simulation that need to be priced. And this pricing step, as you can imagine, as, as you are probably well familiar with, is a huge uh, computation. And this is not the only calculation that needs to be done on a regular basis that imposes this kind of computational load. If, for example, you need to compute sensitivities with respect to this uh, value, let's say CVA, or it could be any other XVA uh, value, you will need to run this kind of simulation several times. Also in the, cap in the calculation of risk profiles, you encounter a sim similar kind of computational um, burden. And also, within capital calculation in IMM CCR, you'll need to run a similar kind of Monte Carlo simulation where you are faced with this pricing problem. And uh, another kind of capital, the one within the context of the IMA FRTB, which is of particular relevance to this presentation because uh, we're going to be showing results, some results that we obtained within this context. You also need to collect scenarios different ones because these come in the form of historical scenarios, but each of the trades in your portfolio in question will be priced on these scenarios. And each trade may be impacted by a number of liquidity horizons, 
and uh, you'll have to, at least in the simplest cases, evaluate these trades on 250 scenarios, but in some cases it can go into 1,000 or 2,000 evaluations. And all these calculations, the calculations that you need to do uh, pretty much daily. I'm not even thinking about the ones that you, can all, that you also have to do on a regular basis, but could be monthly or quarterly, like the identification of period of stress, we need to evaluate your whole portfolio on about 3,000 pricings or 3,000 scenarios resulting in 3,000 pricings. So this collection of calculations is what uh, we identify as the pricing problems that we are facing these days. And I'm not even thinking about the things that we would like to do if we had all the computational power available to us. Uh, things that come in the form of por portfolio optimization. For example, if you wanted to optimize the capital of a portfolio, you would probably need to run an optimization routine. And at each of these iterations, you would have to compute capital. If calculating it once every day is computationally demanding, calculating it many times in the day is pretty much impossible. Now, solutions so far have uh, have come up in many different, uh, many different forms. One of them is basically buying hardware in order to be able to manage this computational demand, but we're getting to the limits of how much hardware can do. So one of the alternatives have been uh, uh, de to develop approximation methods in order to accelerate these processes. And of course, these approximation methods should have several characteristics so that we can rely on them, so that we can use them. Of course, they need to be fast. They need to be accurate. They need to be easy to calibrate if there's any calibration involved in these uh, methods. They should be stable so that we can use them day in, day out. And ideally, they should have low memory impact and should be flexible enough so that we can use them in uh, settings such as cloud-based settings. So this is the kind of problem that we're faced when we, nowadays especially, when we carry out risk calculations. And if anything, is looking to get worse and worse as the years go by. So now let's go into the object that we're going to be using to try and alleviate this problem, which are Chebyshev tensors. And let's talk about the mathematical properties of Chebyshev tensors. But before we get started, let's first of all define what a tensor is. So a tensor is for us just a grid of points with values on them. So take a look at the diagram that you've got on the top part on the right-hand side of your slide. This is a very simple example of a tensor with a three-dimensional grid of points. If we associate to each of these grid of points a real value, what we have is a three-dimensional tensor. So it's a very, very simple object. Associated to a tensor, we have a polynomial interpolant. So a polynomial interpolant is going to be associated to a tensor in the following way. So let's take as an example, a very simple example, a one-dimensional tensor. So we've got here on the right-hand side, a one-dimensional grid of points with black dots. Associated to these black dots, we've got these red stars. These are the values which accompany the grid of points that define the tensor. And there are, you, there are unique um, conditions under which there is a unique polynomial interpolant that goes through these red stars. So the important thing for us is that starting off with tensors, then there is an associated polynomial interpolant that will be uh, associating to this tensor. Now, why are we interested in these, uh, in these tensors? We're interested in these tensors because we want to use them to approximate functions. So take a look at what you have here at the bottom right-hand corner of your slide. In black over here, we've got a function. And if we start with that function, we can define grids of points over here on the domain. That defines part of the tensor. Then we can evaluate the function on those grid points, and that defines the red stars that we've got here. And with a tensor, we can then define the polynomial interpolant associated to the tensor which is given by, these dashed, by this dashed red curve. And the idea is that we'll define, or we can easily define a sequence of tensors in the following way. We can start incrementing the granularity of the grid of points 
defining a sequence of tenses. And for each of these tenses, we've got an interpolant. And with that, we've got a sequence of interpolants that hopefully will approximate closer and closer or will converge closer and closer to the function in question. So this is the aim, basically. And I'll go back to the previous slide and quickly go through it because it's important to understand exactly what is it that we're talking um, about. So we say that we started off with a tensor. A tensor is just a grid of points with values on them. Here on the right-hand side, we've got a three-dimensional example of it. Now associated to a tensor, we have polynomial interpolants. Let me give you a very simple example of how we can come up with a polynomial interpolant starting from a one-dimensional tensor. So on the right-hand side here, we've got a one-dimensional grid of points. Associated to these grid of points, we've got red stars. These are the values that complete the tensor. And under the right conditions, I'm not going to go into which conditions these are, but we'll always have them. There's a unique polynomial interpolant, of course, of certain conditions with certain characteristics. But the main characteristic is that this polynomial interpolates these points. So starting from a tensor, you get this polynomial interpolant. Now, why do we look at these tensors and associated polynomial interpolants? The reason is that we want to approximate functions. So we'll take a look at this diagram at the bottom. If we start with a function, which here is the black curve, uh, kind of denoted with my uh, laser beam. Um, associated to this function, we can always define a grid of points that you see here at the bottom. These grid of points can be distributed any way whatsoever. Then you use the function to evaluate these grid of points. You obtain these red stars. And with that one dimensional tensor, then you can define the associated polynomial interpolant that is an approximator to the function. Now, what we do is very easily, we can adjust or change the number of grid points that define the tensor, and this gives us a sequence of interpolants that hopefully will approximate the function. So that is basically the idea. However, one of the problems with this is that, unfortunately, due to a couple of results that came about in, at the beginning of the 20th century, polynomial interpolants don't have or don't enjoy or have enjoyed throughout the 20th century a very good reputation. First of these results, uh, came about in 1901 by Runge. What did he find? He found a very well-behaved function that nowadays is known as the Runge function. It is an analytic function, so it enjoys high degrees of smoothness, for which these tensors defined through equidistant points and the associated interpolants that are defined through these tensors diverge exponentially away from the function. So basically the opposite effect of what we would like to have. And at the same time, we had uh, a result that came about in 1914, uh, proved by Faber, that says that if you restrict yourself to the class of continuous functions, which is a very reasonable class to restrict to, there is no interpolation scheme that works for this class of functions. So on the face of it, even though polynomials are very good objects to work with because they're very simple objects to start off with, unfortunately, they didn't seem to have the right properties as approximating, op uh, as appro approximating objects. However, one thing that has often been missed even uh, within academics that specialize in the area of approximation theory is that if you change a couple of conditions, then you completely change the results. First condition is how you distribute your points upon which you're going to define the tensor. And the right way to do it is through Chebyshev points. Take a look at the bottom right-hand corner of your slide. Here we've got an interval that goes from minus one to one. And we take the semicircle, the upper half of the circle or the unitary circle denoted here by blue, take equidistant points on these unitary circle and then project them down to the real line. That defines Chebyshev points. So notice they're gonna be agglomerated towards the endpoints. The analytic definition, you can see it here on the left-hand side is the, the one dimensional case. This can be generalized to high dimensions without any problem. But one thing to notice is that they're very easy to define and very easy to implement in a computer. And the second condition uh, that changes the whole results on interpolants um, is related to the class of functions that we need to restrict ourselves down to. That is the class of analytic functions. Basically, by taking these two restrictions and uh, collecting quite a few results that came about uh, throughout the 20th century, and some of them actually more recently in the 21st century, we obtain this theorem that for us is key. And it says the following. If you've got an analytic function defined on a compact domain, in RD, notice that D here is any, uh, gives you the dimension and is any value, then the Chebyshev interpolant of degree n converges exponentially to the function f as n tends 
to infinity. And let me make a comment of what this means. What, um, what is the degree n of the interpolant? So the degree n of the interpolant is the degree of it as a polynomial. But the important thing is it's directly proportional and directly related to the number of points of the tensor that defines the interpolant. And if you remember well, what I said is the way that we define these interpolants for a given function is that we first define the tensor by defining grip points, which in this case, they're going to be distributed according to Chebyshev. And then we evaluate the function on these grip points to produce the tensor. So what this theorem says is that the function doesn't need to be evaluated on that many points in order to obtain high degrees of accuracy. And this can be very well, or this is very easy to show in a plot like the one that we've got on the right hand side. So what do we have here? What we did is we took a two dimensional function, in this case, it's a spot ball surface. And we considered a collection of tensors where we started increasing the number of grid points on the tensor distributed according to Chebyshev. So what we have is a collection of Chebyshev tensors and associated Chebyshev interpolants. And for each of these interpolants or tensors, we measured its error or the degree of accuracy with respect to the two dimensional function. And if you see here on the plot, on the x axis, we've got the number of points on the tensor. The y axis is the error of the corresponding tensors in log scale. This is very important. And this here, these points here, the red dots and the lines joining these red dots represent the decay, which clearly can be seen to be exponential, the decay of the error as you increase the number of points on the tensor. At the same time, we also considered another tensor. This tensor is defined by equidistant points. And the interpolation that we used was linear interpolation. And the errors as we increase the number of points on the tensor are given to you by the blue dots. You can clearly see the difference between the two. But this one experiences exponential decay. Notice that we've got here log um, a log scale on the y-axis the, the other sort of tensor we have a very very slow decay let me give you uh let me point you in two particular sections of this plot let's say that you've got uh here the 250 uh, grid points with chevy chef tensors we obtain an accuracy of 10 to the minus 7 whereas with this other sort of tensors we obtain something of the sort of 10 to the minus one. If we decrease the number of points, grid points, all the way down to about 15, we have the Chebyshev points or the Chebyshev tensors have an accuracy of about 10 to the minus one, which is the same accuracy that we obtained with the other tensor, but we had to increase it all the way up to 250. So there's a big difference in the number of times that you have to evaluate your function in order to produce the tensor that has the same accuracy here for Chebyshev, is about 15 and the other one is 250. This is basically what comes as a result of this theorem over here. Now, all this is good, but it's mathematics so far on paper, this uh, exponential uh, convergence. And we're in the business of implementing these things uh, on a computer. Now, as we all know, uh, computers uh, make rounding off errors all the time. And unfortunately, some algorithms that should give you some results on paper often give you a completely different result, and this is because they are numerically unstable. Now, the right algorithm to evaluate these interpolants, the Chebyshev interpolants, comes in the form of the barycentric interpolation formula. The one-dimensional formula or case is shown here in the middle of your slide. Of course, it can be generalized to higher dimensions, but there are three main properties that I would like to highlight about this formula. The first one, as I said, is that it's numerically stable, so it's unaffected by rounding off errors on your computer. The second is that it evaluates in linear time with respect to n, where n is the degree of the interpolant, which as I said, is essentially the same as the number of points on your tensor, which is the number of times that you have to evaluate your function on the grid points to define your tensor. So it is very, very, very quick to evaluate. And third, and also very important, is that the only bit of information that this formula needs in order to be able to evaluate these interpolants are the Chebyshev points, which here are denoted by xi, and also the values of the function on these Chebyshev points. That is it. 
basically what this means is that the, you don't need to take an extra step to go from the tensor to the interpolant in order to then be able to evaluate it. The tensor information is all that you need. Once you've built it, you're ready to use the barycentric interpolation formula, which is very quick in order to be able to evaluate, which ultimately is what we want these tensors to do. And great, all this uh, so far uh, sounds pretty good, but ultimately, as we said, we want to be able to tackle the problem that we presented at the beginning, which is the pricing problem in risk calculations. So we want to apply these Chebyshev tensors to these pricing functions. The good thing is that outside of isolated points, pricing functions are analytic. That is, they are piecewise analytic. Usually these uh, points come in the form of payments or barriers or strikes. But outside of those points, you've got chunks of these pricing functions for which you can build these tensors. So let me just give you a quick summary of what we've seen so far. First of all, we've got theorem that says that we restricted to analytic functions. We've got exponential convergence, which means that high levels of accuracy are achieved with only a few calls to the original function. Remember that the way that we obtain these interpolants is you start with a function, you build a tensor for these functions. The tensor requires uh, specifying the grid points, which are suited according to Chebyshev, and then you evaluate the function on these grid points, got your tensor, and with that barycentric interpolation formula, you can evaluate them really, really quickly. Second point is that this barycentric interpolation formula is a formula which is numerically stable and is really, really, really fast. And third, and very important for us, is that all this applies to pricing functions. By the way, if you are interested in any more details regarding the theory of Chebyshev and also applications of this theory specifically within, within risk calculations, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us. We can give give you many more references. This slide here contains like a collage of some of the papers, the textbooks that we've found uh, very interesting. In particular, I would like to draw your attention to the one in the center, Approximation Theory and Approximation Practice, written by Professor Trefeden in the University of Oxford. He's been uh, working for many, many years with uh, Chebyshev's spectral methods. He's, uh, I would say, been one of the uh, people within academia responsible for highlighting some of the advantages that come with uh, using change of points and change of sequences and, and so on. Uh, at the end of the presentation, you'll see a slide that has written uh, references that you can use in order to take a look at, at these papers that contain much more information, of course. Um, and of course, if you want to get in contact with us, you'll see at the bottom of these slides, there's my email address. Also, you'll see the uh, address, uh, uh, the link to our website. Feel free to visit it. Feel free to contact us anytime that you need, that you have a question regarding this or the applications of the theory within, within finance. And um, as I said, we've got a website. And in the website, you'll be able to find quite a lot of resources if you're interested in anything regarding the theory of Chebyshev and also the way that you can apply it within, within risk. Uh, you'll see when you go to our website, there's this uh, section here, research. You'll find some of the publications. Uh, you'll also find ways to contact us. And also one of the things we've come up with that, uh, that people have found so far really useful are a collection of videos that we've uh, put up online where we explain some of this, uh, this methodology and also how it, it can be applied with your, within your own systems. And also we've implemented a lot of these methods in our own library that you're more than welcome to download from our website. So take a look at it. You can download it, you can get in contact with us, ask us how to uh, use it, to best use it. I mean, we've got quite a bit of experience with it, so we can point you in the right direction. So now let's get into the next section, which is, okay, we've already seen what these church of tensors are and some of the mathematical properties behind them. But ultimately, we want to be able to use them within risk calculations. And that imp uh, implies uh, basically incorporating them into risk engines. This slide over here, let's focus first on the top part of the slide. This flow diagram depicts the typical way in which risk calculations are done. This is the one which uses your own risk systems. So you start by first of all collecting a collection of risk scenarios. As an example here, I use 5,000 of them. Once you collect them, then you pass them to the pricing engine. 
where they meet the portfolio and your pricing functions get caught on all these 5,000 scenarios in order to produce a distribution of prices. Now this step, exactly this, this is the step that we've identified as a big problem, which is a pricing problem in risk calculations. And it comes, as you can see, because of the number of times that you have to call your pricing functions on all the collection of risk scenarios which are involved in the calculation. But once you've gone through this uh, point and you have your price distributions, then you can come up with all the risk metrics that you're interested in, which could be CDAs or capital values and so on and so on and so on. So this way of computing uh, your risk metrics is what we call the brute force approach and it's our benchmark. If we had all the computational power available to us that we need in order to be able to use these risk um, engines on a regular basis and to do all the calculations that we would like to do, and this is what we would use. The routines are very accurate, and, but unfortunately come uh, at a cost, which is the computational cost that I've been talking about. So with Chevichev tensors, let's say your own implementation or our own library that we call the MOPIX library, how do we use such an implementation? How do we use Chevichev tensors within this, uh, these risk calculations? So actually, a lot of it is not changed. So you start with risk scenarios, the 5,000 scenarios that I gave here of an example. Those are collected in the same way as you would normally do. But then the next step is the key one. You go from these scenarios to building your Chebyshev tensor. And remember that in order to build a Chebyshev tensor, what you need is first of all, specify the grid points of the tensor. And this is the first step that needs to be done. So you go from these risk scenarios to identifying which are going to be the grid points for your tensor. And this, this step is key. Let's assume that we've already done that. Once we've got those grid points, then you pass them to the pricing engine. You price all these grid points because that's what you need in order to obtain your Chebyshev tensor. You get here in this, uh, this box here, your Chebyshev tensor. And with your Chebyshev tensor, using the barycentric interpolation formula, then you can price all these 5,000 risk scenarios that you need to price in order to come up with a price distribution and ultimately with your risk metric. So as you can see, the only bid that gets affected is the pricing step. And you go from these risk scenarios to determining your grid points on the tensor, evaluating these grid points to obtain the tensor, and that's basically it. The barycentric interpolation formula is so fast that the pricing of those 5,000 scenarios or whichever number they are will take no time compared to the rest of the process. Now, let me uh, draw your attention to this first step here, because if you are to get any computational benefits from this approach, this step has to be properly done. Here as an example, I went from 5,000 scenarios to defining 100 grid points. What this means is that you've saved 4,900 evaluations from your computational, if you compare it to the brute force approach, because in the brute force approach, you evaluate your pricing functions in 5,000 scenarios. Here, we came up with 100 grid points that you need to evaluate, so only 100 evaluations. And that's where the computational savings come in. So this step of how to define your grid of points distributed according to Chep Chep is crucial. And this is what we're gonna start, what we're gonna talk about. Now, before we talk about how we define these grid points in such a way that, of course, we get a small number of grid points, because that's how we get computational uh, benefits, let's talk about a problem that all tensors face, and that is the curse of dimensionality. Now, the curse of dimensionality says that as the dimensionality of the tensor increases, the number of points on the tensor grows exponentially. In particular, if D is the dimensionality of your tensor, and you have n points per dimensionality, you end up with n to the d points on your tensor. So clearly as d increases, the number of points on your grid increases exponentially. Now, why is this a problem for us? Well, the problem is because we want to build, build tensors to pricing functions. These pricing functions are high dimensional. That's how they come. Let me give you an example, which in fact we're going to be using for the rest of the presentation. Take a swaption. Swaption usually takes two yield curves. Let's say that each yield curve has 25 tenors. So we're talking about 50 dimensions already from the yield curves. And it takes hundreds of implied volatility. So we're talking about a function which is in the hundreds in terms of its dimensionality. So it's impossible to build tensor for such a function. 
just to give you an idea of a tensor that has two points per dimension, which is nothing, which is the minimum, uh, the, the minimum in fact, and a tensor of 100 dimensions, we would define 1.27 times 10 to the 30 grid points. And this, of course, is just impossible to build, at least uh, from the outset, naively, let's say, if you want to evaluate each of those points and you want to save them in memory. So the question is, how do we sidestep this problem? And we've got three techniques that we propose in order to solve this problem, which are applied depending on the particular situation. So here at the top, we see the flow of a risk calculation, which uses uh, Chebyshev tensors that we had before. You've got your risk scenarios. And as I said, this first step, going from the risk scenarios to defining the grid points is the essential step. Because once you have that, you just evaluate these grid points with your pricing functions, that gives you a tensor. Our eccentric interpolation formula evaluates all the risk scenarios to obtain price distribution and then the risk metrics. And it is in this step that one has to decide which technique to use in order to define the grid points. And that's why it's application specific. Once you've done that, the rest uh, is common to all applications. And these techniques are the compensation technique which is usually applied in XVA sorts of calculations. And we'll go that, uh, into that in a second. You have a very recent technique, very interesting, uh, that came up this year called the, or what we call the completion algorithm that has a strong machine learning flavor. flavor. Uh, we're still investigating, as we speak, uh, this technique to understand it better, to see exactly where it fits and which kind of situations it fits uh, best. And the last of these techniques is called the sliding technique, which uh, usually gets applied in contexts like FRTB. And it's of particular relevance to us because we're going to be presenting results that we obtain within a real uh, risk engine of a bank uh, that, uh, where we used this technique in order to tackle the pricing problem in the FRTB case. Let's go first into the composition technique. As I said, this technique gets usually applied within Monte Carlo simulations where we use low dimensional models. So what am, I, what am I talking about here? Let's say you've got a Monte Carlo simulation. So you generate all the nodes in your simulation. I said that we roughly speaking have about, we have about half a million of these uh, nodes. And let's say that we're interested in pricing a swaption on each of these nodes. Now swaption, as I said, takes hundreds of uh, implied volatilities and tens of uh, interest rates. However, in order to generate these yield curves and possible spread curves and implied volatility within the Monte Carlo simulation, we usually use uh, risk factor division models like the one factor Holland White model or three factor Gaussian model or some autoregressive model for implied volatilities. We may use some safe model and so on. But the important thing about these models is that they tend to have low dimensionality. And what they first do is they generate in the Monte Carlo simulation, uh, let's say in the, in the example of the Holland White model, they generate what we know as short rates. And these short rates, which may be one, two, or three, let's say, are first generated. And then using the model and the function that I've denoted here by G, we go from this small, uh, low dimensional space that I've denoted here by RK, which could be one, two, or three, let's say one in the case of the one facts model, to RN, which is the space where in this particular case, the yield curve will live. So it's a function that goes from R to R30. This is for the particular case uh, of how we generate the yield curves. Now, if we're dealing with a swaption and the swaption takes two yield curves and implied volatilities, you've got possibly several of these models that you put together in order to generate the whole thing. And when you put the corresponding G functions together, you end up with a function it goes from RK, which is low dimensional, let's say it could be one, two, three, four, five, roughly speaking, all the way to RN, where N can be in the hundreds. And this is very important because your pricing function for the swaption, which I've denoted here by P, initially takes values on this high dimensional space. But because of the way these risk factors are born, you have this function G that you can compose with P. And below here, we define that composition as F. And S can be thought of as the pricing function that doesn't take, let's say, market scenarios, but takes these risk factor scenarios. 
and as such is a low dimensional function that goes from RK all the way to R. And for such a function, we can build a single chip chip tensor. So that is, this is one of the ways in, you, in which you can build your grid of points in a manageable fashion. Second technique that I mentioned is the completion algorithm, or what we call the completion algorithm. This uh, came up in a paper earlier this year that you can see on the right hand side. Catherine Glau and some of her collaborators uh, published it. And basically, the idea is that you want to tackle the issue of the curse of dimensionality when you're dealing with tensors that have, let's say, 10 or 20 dimensions. Such a tensor is very difficult to work with. It's uh, pretty much impossible to build a tensor of that dimensionality. So what they do is the following. So uh, you've got this uh, grid point, which are going to be distributed according to Chef Chef, because we know the really good properties that this uh, gives you. So you start with these grid points. Now you need to evaluate them, but you can't afford to evaluate all of them at this uh, dimensionality. So what you do is evaluate them, let's say on 5% of the points. So what you have is in a way, a partial view of your tensor. You don't have the whole tensor, you only have a fraction of the points. And then what they do is focus or restrict themselves to a class of tensors, which are called, or these are tensors expressed in TT format of low rank. I'm not going to go into the details of what this means, but the intuition behind it is that these are tensors which are compressible in memory. So you've got all the information that you need from these tensors, and they could be 10, 20 dimensions, but you can store them in memory given the way that they're expressed. So basically, these are, these are, these are very specific special tensors that you can uh, deal with even though they have high dimensions. Now, what they do is the following. Restricted to the space of these compressible tensors, they run an optimization routine where they try and find the best compressible tensor that approximates the tensor that they ultimately would like to have, restricted or only using that 5% of the information of the original tensor. So this optimization routine, of course, has a very, uh, is, is, is akin to the optimization routines that are run on a regular basis in machine learning, where you have a training set and a testing set, and you adjust your parameters and ultimately, you find at the end of the day a compressible tensor, that is a tensor that you can actually work with in, in a computer that hopefully is close enough to the tensor that you originally wanted, which is the tensor that you would get from the function that you want to approximate. And the results they obtain are actually pretty, pretty good. Of course, they're relying on the fact that pricing functions are functions which are well behaved. So um, in a way, what they show is that this Space of compressible tensors can approximate quite well these, uh, these functions. And they report very high levels of accuracy and uh, really good compression rates, because remember that we're dealing with compressible tensors, and also phenomenal accelerations in terms of uh, when you use these things for risk calculations. Now, we're, we're still in the process of um, exploring this technique uh, a bit further, but of course, something that I've already quickly tested is these tensors apply to the previous setting that you have uh, to compare it to the situation where you want to build a single chepitive of tensor. So in the previous situation, like I said, you've got low dimensional models that allow you to build a single chepitive of tensor, but what if you can even improve that by evaluating not whole, the whole tensor, but let's say a fraction of the tensor, and then trying to run the completion algorithm in order to use one of these compressible tensors. So there is uh, the possibility of using it there, but there's also scope to use it in other settings. Finally, last of these techniques that I want to talk to you about is the sliding technique. As I said, very relevant because this is the one that we obtain with uh, the we use within uh, FRTB, for which we will show you results. And this technique consists of the following. First of all, it gets applied in cases which are high dimensional. As you know, in FRTB, the risk factors are historical, so they're not generated by some low dimensional model. They already are given to you in the full dimensionality. So in the case of the swaption, we're dealing with hundreds of dimensions. So what do we do in this particular case? Well, first of all, we know that risk factors, if appropriately cataloged, they exhibit high degrees of correlation. So the first thing that we do is reduce the dimensionality of these risk factors using PCA, which combines really well with the sliding technique, as you will see in a second. So you apply PCA, let's say in the case of the swaption, to the interface. You apply PCA to the implied volatilities 
and you reduce the problem first from hundreds of dimensions to let's say 30, 40, even 50 dimensions, still quite a high dimensional uh, situation. But the important thing is that we can, uh, by doing this, we pretty much eliminate all the noise that could have come from applying PCA. And the second important thing about PCA is that it changes the frame of reference that it started off with. And now the principal components point in the directions of greatest variance of the data. And this allows uh, us with this line technique to capture the movement of the function much better. So once we reduce the dimensionality of the problem to let's say 30 with principal components analysis, we do the following. And this is where the slides come in, or sliding technique. Take a look at the left-hand side of the slide. Here we've got a, just as an example, it's a three-dimensional grid or a three-dimensional tensor. Of course, for a three-dimensional tensor, we wouldn't use the, slider, the sliding technique, but this is just as an illustration. And let's say that we define four points per dimension. This gives us a total of 64 grid points. And we've got a single tensor, as we have here. Perfect. You can use that. However, the, what could you do? One thing that you could do is consider combinations of these principal components and group them together. So for example, as we see in this example at the top, you take the first principal component, the second principal component, and build a tensor for it. As you can see here at the bottom, it's got a tensor, just most of the principal components. And then you take the third principal component and build a tensor for it on its own, which is up here. And the idea is that you end up with two tensors, that one and that one, that you put together in a similar way to the way that a Taylor approximation carries out its, its um, evaluation. You put them together in order to come up with an evaluation for this um, these collection of tensors that come together to constitute what we call a slider or a, a, yeah, a slider. Now, the important thing to bear in mind is that when you build a tensor, let's say for the first principal component and the second principal component, you're really capturing well all the movements of the function in the space spanned by these principal components, which in themselves capture the movement of the risk factors. So in this way, it has a huge advantage over something like Taylor approximation. Now, just in the way that we put PCA, uh, the pr first principal component and the, and the second principal component together and then separate the third, we can take a more extreme approach, like the one that we've got at the bottom. You're free to take any combination whatsoever. And you can build three tensors, first principal component, the second principal component, and separate third principal component. And again, in the same way, you can put them together in order to constitute your grid point. And notice what has happened to the size of the um, mesh that constitutes the tensor. From the full tensor in three dimensions, we went from 64 to this other one that has 20, and this other more extreme case, which has 12. And this is the way that we sidestep the problem of the cursive dimensionality in this particular context. So as I said, these are the three techniques that can be used in order to go from the set of risk scenarios to defining the grid points on your tensor. And this slide, uh, we put it here so that uh, we get an idea of what are the sort of areas where we could apply these three techniques and the sort of results that one that we have normally seen. So for example, here on the left-hand side business line, we've got market risk capital, FRTB IMA. We normally see computational savings of about 90%. What does this mean in terms of the brute force approach that uh, one would love to be able to use? Well, for every one hour of brute force approach, that gets reduced down to six minutes if you use these Chevy chip tensors. Now, these six minutes are entirely the time that you take to build these Chevy chip tensors. Remember that in order to build them, you first of all define what the grid points are. And these, once you've uh, defined how you're going to come up with these grid points, then uh, producing them on a computer is immediate. It doesn't take any time. Then come these six minutes, which would be the time that you would evaluate your pricing functions on these grid points. And once you've produced this or these tensors, you evaluate them with the barycentric interpolation formula, which literally takes no time. We're talking about microsecond range. When you compare that to the rest of the process, that is absolutely negligible. So really the computational time comes in, uh, or you can calculate it by uh, the number of times that you are not evaluating your pricing function. And as I said here, a 90% computational saving, savings corresponds to roughly every one hour of brute force approach down to six minutes 
And for any other business line that we've tried, say XVA pricing, XVA hedging, we see similar kind of savings, 90, 95%. We go from one hour for every one hour of brute force approach to about three minutes, five, six minutes, roughly. In the case of dynamic initial margin, where one is interested in computing dynamic sensitivities, the computational savings are enormous. This has to do with the fact that the brute force approach is very expensive in this particular case. So we have observed savings of up to 99%. So we're talking about reducing one hour down to seconds, 36 seconds in this case. And for other stuff where we've tested a CCR capital, CBA, FRTB, and so on, we see similar kind of savings, about 90, 95% or even higher. Now let's go to the final section of the presentation where we present the results that we obtained from this case study carried out within the systems of a tier one bank. First of all, let me give you a bit of the background. So uh, we're interested in computing capital under FR to the IMA. This requires a calculation of expected shortfall with different liquidity horizons. This is, as you, I'm sure you're, uh, you're aware of, a massive computational, imposes a massive computational demand. Now the POC was uh, very specific. We had 10 weeks where basically we had to use the MOCAC methodology in order to optimize the pricing process, which is, as I said at the beginning, the main problem that we're focusing on. What was the scope of the test? We were given two portfolios, one of swaps with 635 swaps, one of swaptions with 425, both single currency, we were given a total of 3,000 scenarios, roughly, it was a bit more than that, which corresponds to about 10 years worth of historic data. And it was specified that we were to compute expected shortfall for these 3,000 scenarios, and also for the last 250. And there were very clear objectives. First one was that MOCAX te technology should reduce the computational burden by at least 50 cents. The error which was measured at the level of expected shortfall, shouldn't be more than 10%, the benchmark being the brute force approach that I've mentioned. And third, we have to show that the, these Chevichev, Chevichev tensors implemented in our, in our software and the MOCAX library uh, were to be integrated into the systems in a seamless manner. As I said, the technique that we employed was the slider technique uh, alongside with PCA. As I said, we were talking about, we were dealing with swaps, we were dealing with swaptions. Swaps depend on two curves, one for ordering, forwarding, one for discounting, the same as swaptions. We had implied volatility in the case of swaptions, so we're talking about hundreds of dimensions for swaptions and tens of dimensions for swaps. Uh, in both cases, we applied PCA, separating interest rates to implied volatilities and applying PCA to each of them. When you put them together after applying PCA, that gives you the domain where you have to build your slider. In the case of a 30 dimensional slider that we want to build, for example, in the case of swaptions, still a single tensor is impossible. We're talking about tensors with 9.3 times 10 to the 20 points. So completely unviable. However, using the slider, we were able to reduce it down to about 150 points, which is perfect for what you're interested in because this is less than the number of times that we'll have to evaluate the scenarios that we were given. And of course, uh, given that it's a combination of two techniques, PCA and the slide technique, we had two sources of noise in this, uh, in this technique, one coming from PCA, the other one coming from the MOCAX slider. And here on the right-hand side, we've got this diagram to show roughly what we were doing. Basically, first reducing the dimensionality of the problem, and also very important, um, changing the coordinate reference because PCA gives you a completely different coordinate reference, which can be quite helpful. And then on that domain, build your tensors. So what were the results that we obtained? These are the results for swaps. So portfolio and factors. As I said, we were given 635 swaps, evaluated on 3,131 historic shocks. We started with 54 dimensions. That was the dimensionality of the pricing function for the swaps, because these are the number of rates of tenors that we were given for the uh, yield curves. That was reduced down to 20 dimensions with PCA. Notice that we're going quite far into the, the principal component space with the idea of not just 
keeping 2, 3, which is normally what people use PCA for, because in this way, by going up, we capture most of the movement of the data, which is also what we're interested in doing. And at the same time, this doesn't impose uh, any difficulty for the sliders. We can build sliders with that dimensionality without much of a problem. Now, the results, computational gains were really good, 96.77%. This is basically how much we reduced the computational cost with respect to the full uh, brute force approach. The accuracy at the level of expected shortfall was at 0.02%. And also something else that we were asked to do was to uh, compare the two PNL distributions from which you compute the expected shortfall. There are two ways that uh, we were supposed to do it. One of them was by computing the correlation of the two PNLs, in which case, in this particular case, we obtained a correlation pretty much uh, essentially one. And the other way of comparing the distributions was through the kolmogorov smirnov statistical test, which is the test designed to identify if there's evidence of two distributions not being the same. If the p-value associated to this test is low, let's say less than 0 0.05, then you've got evidence to suggest that the distributions are uh, not the same. In this case, we've got a very high p-value, which means there's no evidence whatsoever. Take a look at the plots. On the left-hand side, we've got the comparison of the two PNL distributions. On the y-axis is the PNL distribution obtained with MOCAX, and on the x-axis is the PNL distribution obtained through the brute force approach. If these distributions were to be identical point to point, we would obtain a perfect diagonal, which is very close to what we get in this case. So these are very, very good results. And on the right-hand side, we obtain the result that ultimately we wanted, which is the expected shortfall value, because ultimately that's what is used to then compute the capital value, which ultimately is the whole point of this um, calculation. And we see here, this bar, blue bar, gives you the value of the expected shortfall through brute force, and the red dot gives you the value of the MOCAX expected shortfall. They're basically almost the same. They're barely, uh, you can barely distinguish them from the plot. The black line is just the error threshold that we were given. So really good results for these swaps. Now let's take a look at what we obtained for swaptions. Now for swaptions, we had the added um, issue that there are two liquidity horizons to consider. The first one is the 10-day liquidity horizon, which is on the left-hand side, which, and you compute the expected shortfall by shocking all the risk factors, so yield curves and implied volatility. We had 3,108 uh, scenarios in this case. Uh, we had 415 risk factors, meaning that this is the dimensionality, the pricing function. And we had 425 trades in the portfolio. We reduced the dimensionality of the problem to 30 dimensions. And the results that we obtained are below here. The computational gain is of 95%. The ES error is of 0. 0.36%, so nothing. And again, correlation and p-value of Kolmogorov's Smirnov test are very, very good. Now, the other liquidity horizon that we have to consider in the case of these swaptions in particular, because different trades get affected differently, was the 60-day liquidity horizon. Here, yield curves are fixed and implied volatilities are shocked. Now, the key thing here was that we built a single object, one tensor or one slider for both liquidity horizons. And the way that we did it means that independent on the number of liquidity horizons, we could have had another two, we would have been able to reuse that object. And that is key because remember that the, um, the only uh, overhead incurred by using these change of tensors comes in the form of building the tensor. So once you've built it, you can reuse it for many different things. And it will be, uh, you can use it very, very quickly or very efficiently because of the barycentric interpolation formula. So in this case, you can see here below that the computational gain, we've put it at 100%. Because we want to highlight the fact that we built a single object for which you have a computational gain with respect to the 10-day liquidity horizon. But when you reuse it for the 60-day liquidity horizon, given that it takes almost no time to evaluate these 3,000 scenarios, you don't have any overhead in terms of the building of the object. You already have your object built. And with that object, we obtained very good ES error of 2%, and also the correlation and p-value the, of these distributions was very, very good. Now, we were also asked, as I said, uh, to take a look at what happened when you only took the last 
250 scenarios, which are used for the capital calculation of the day. So in this case, uh, the, on the left-hand side, you'll see the results of swaps, which are only affected by one liquidity horizon, the 10-day liquidity horizon. Again, we say computation gain 100% because there's no building uh, cost involved. We had an ES error of 0.24, really good correlation, really good uh, p-value. In the case of Swaption's 10-day liquidity horizon, we get an ES error of 0.19. Again, really good correlation and p-value. And in the case of the 60-day liquidity horizon, you get an error of 0.04%. Very good correlation, very good p-value. Now, there is something here that is important. Notice that we built one single object per trade type, and then we reused it for all the other calculations that we needed in this POC. And that is, this is something which is a very strong property of these objects. So you may be faced with the following situation that we've depicted in this flow diagram on a, let's say, regular basis. And the purpose of this slide is to illustrate what are the choices that you may have to make. They're not difficult choices. They will depend on the task that you have in your hands. Let's say you start a day and you have 3,000 scenarios available, right? As we did in this POC, we may decide to calibrate or to build your object for these 3,000 scenarios. Uh, given that it's a, a relatively big data set, you may want to use a high dimensionality for your PCA. And as we saw in this POC, you can use this to calculate expected shortfall for the whole uh, 3,000 uh, scenarios or just for the last 250. So you can use it for the period of stress. And at the same time, you can use it for the capital calculation on the day, obtaining these very good results, uh, having 95% plus computation gains, errors at the level of expected shortfall of less than 3%. Uh, in the case of the last 250, we even had errors of less than 1%. But perhaps on that day, you don't need to build objects for 3,000 scenarios. You may only need to evaluate on the last 250. So maybe you decide to only build sensors for that, in which case you can afford, given the size of the data set, to use a lower dimensionality for your PCA. And the implications of this are important. This means that the size of your tensor is going to be smaller, hence less cost to your pricing functions, hence you boost your computational gains. And in this case, you're expecting to get something like 90% computational gain with errors of less than 3% at the level of expected shortfall in order to be able to calculate your capital values. Now, on top of all these options that I've already mentioned, you've got the following things that you could do. And we call these um, type of exercises, we call them the what if type of analysis. Now, the thing with these objects, with these church of tensors, the very simple objects that you can serialize you can then load them up from memory and use them for any other calculation that you may be interested in. Sure, these calculations that I've spoken about, these are the kind of calculations that you must do, partly because, well, mainly because of regulation and so on, but there are other things that maybe you would like to do, but nowadays because of lack of computational power, they're very difficult. And one of them I've already mentioned at the beginning was the optimization of capital. Let's say that you've got a portfolio, but you're not happy with the capital uh, assigned to that portfolio, it doesn't align with your risk appetite, what you can do is run optimization routines, and at each of these iterations, you will need to calculate your capital. And what you play around with is maybe taking away a few trades from your portfolio or introducing new ones in order to see how, what happens with the capital. And of course, these optimization routines usually, uh, in a very smart way, guide you in the direction where you're going to try and minimize this capital. But in order to do this, you should be able, or one must be able to compute capital very, very quickly. But if you've already built for your daily calculation, these chip chip tensors, then you can reuse them in order to be able to run these optimization uh, problems. And this can give you, of course, def, uh, an advantage. And of course, they can also be re reused for other things, such as stress testing. But here you open up a whole plethora of options, which can give you a definite advantage. So just a summary on the results that I presented from this POC. I've ident we identified three main things which we should focus on. First of all, is the computational gain. We're talking about computational gains of 90% plus, uh, considering all these liquidity horizons and, uh, and with really good accuracy, which is the second point at the level of expected shortfall. In all cases, we saw errors of less than 3%. And the third, which is very important, is once you've built these objects, you can reuse them very quickly because the only overhead that you incur 
in this technique is the building of the tenses. Once you have them, virocentric interpolation formula allows you to evaluate them very, very efficiently. Now, one of the things that I've often encountered when I deal with these kind of products is, so I showed you results for swaps and swaptions. We get really good results, but usually people are not that bothered about these kind of uh, trait types because they're considered to be, the pricing routines are, tend to be quite fast, and it's true. They tend to be analytic, and they're not that expensive to run. But one thing that one should bear in mind is that they typically constitute about, in conjunction, about 80 to 90% of typical portfolios. So it's very important that any approximation technique that you use, it better work for these kind of products because even if they don't take a huge amount of your computation on a regular basis, they will just from sheer volume, they will be important and they will take some time. If you reduce 90% of this computation, you will immediately make available quite a lot of computational power that you could use for other things. And if in combination to these two, you add the fact that we've already tested these things in other places, in other, in other POCs. We've already tested the mutants that even though they don't constitute, uh, in terms of volume, a significant amount of portfolio, they do constitute, because of their computational complexity, which is very high, they do constitute a big part of your daily calculation. So taking care of all these products that we have tested in different places, which are interest rate uh, swaps, swap, uh, swaptions, the mutants, cross currency swaps, IR options, and so on, we basically cover the bulk of an interest rate portfolio. And of course, these techniques are not restricted to just interest rates. I've focused through the example that I used and the presentation of the results that we've given, uh, focused mainly on interest rates, but this is just because of the data the, the, that we had available. We've already tested it for other asset classes. The approach is generic enough that it applies to virtually every trade, which is significant in your portfolios, irrespective of uh, asset class. And finally, if you're interested in uh, carrying out a POC of this nature in your own systems, please feel free to get in touch. As we've already told you from the beginning, we really like collaborating with people, um, being able to confront together the problems that you have, coming up with the solutions. We already have quite a bit of experience in introducing these techniques within uh, systems, so you'll definitely benefit from that. Uh, we usually work in collaboration with consultancy companies, so that's definitely an option if something that you prefer. And of course, if you, if you prefer to do this on your own, of course, feel free to download the software from our website and also ask us for advice on how to use it and so on. So conclusions that we get from the whole presentation. As I said, first of all, we spoke about the problem that we have identified as the computational problem in risk calculation, calculations, and this comes in the form of the pricing step, having to price all these risk scenarios in each of the many risk calculations that you have to carry out on a regular basis, and this presents uh, or is a major computational bottleneck. Then we saw uh, what Chebyshev tensors are, some of the mathematical properties behind Chebyshev tensors, and how these can be applied to pricing functions and introduced within risk engines. Finally, we presented some results that were obtained within the systems of an actual tier one bank uh, where we applied these church of tensors to try and alleviate the pricing problem presented within the context of FRTB IMA. So great, thank you very much for coming to this presentation. Here you can see some of the contact details that you can use in order to reach us. And as I said, at the end, we have these references that you can take a look at. Feel free to get in contact with us if you need more references or have any questions whatsoever. Thank you very much. Okay, so somebody's asking about Chevyjev points, as in what makes them special? Okay, so, well, the answer, as in the mathematics behind what makes uh, the distribution of Chebyshev points so so special is, is not uh, trivial. It's one of these kind of things that is better to address literally with pen and paper. But I can I can give you sort of an, an insight into what's going on with the distribution of points versus the distribution of points of a different kind, like equidistant, which is what people normally use, and it makes sense. I mean, why would you use uh, something different? 
So um, the, the result that I presented here when we're talking about the exponential conversions, which is uh, pretty strong, um, applies to uh, analytic functions. Now, analytic functions uh, in the real variable have a particular property, which is that they can be extended to the complex plane. And when they get extended to the complex plane, of course, you can start defining contour integrals, complex contour integrals around the domain where the, or on the domain where you're defining your function. Now, it so happens, and this is one of, of course, there's quite a bit of mathematics behind this, but it so happens that when you define a grid of points, any grid of points, doesn't matter which one it is, when you define the interpolants on those grid of points to the function in question, uh, you can estimate, or you can, uh, it's not an estimate, you actually can compute or calculate or come up with an expression for the difference or the error between the function and the interpolator, which comes in the form of a contour integral. And um, inside that contour integral, the expression that you find is dominated by these, um, by these grid points. So the grid points appear within this contour integral. And actually the contour, contour integral that you have, the expression that you have for it, is very similar to the integral that defines the energy. A physicist will find uh, this actually quite, quite interesting. It's very similar to the way that you define the energy of a system that has electric charges. And uh, it so happens that when you start playing around with the distribution of these points, the distribution that minimizes the energy of the system is the one that has points agglomerating towards the endpoints of the interval of the function, which, uh, and in particular, when you have the distribution according to Chebyshev, this is when you reach a minimum in this, in this system. But it, it just so happens that you can actually compute or that you can actually express the difference between the function and the interpolator in terms of an integral, a contour integral, where inside you've got, uh, as a dominating factor, the distribution of the points. And in very specific cases, you can actually see how you can bound that integral by expressions that converge exponentially to zero, saying that basically, as, as you increase the number of points on your grid, if they're distributed according to Chebyshev, you'll be able to bound the error of the, in, of the interpolator with respect to the function in an exponential manner. But if you change the distribution of these points, let's say equidistant, in some cases you can actually show that you can uh, diverge uh, away. So, I mean, this, this is the way that I've always uh, understood it. If you want to take a look at uh, many more details, um, I recommend that you go to Trefeden's textbook. I think there is at least a couple of chapters dedicated to, the, to these ideas, and you will find further references there because even in, in his textbook, he doesn't cover all the aspects related to uh, the special distribution of points that uh, Chebyshev uh, points constitute. Uh, there's another question that says that uh, with it, will this also work with path dependent products? It does. But the important thing here, again, as I said at some point in the presentation, is that you have to be very careful of how you define your tensors. So you will have to incorporate the fact that you've got path dependencies, but you can definitely do it. So a lot of times, one of the things that you have to do is introduce a variable as a dimensionality within your tensor that has precisely this path dependency. And with that, one should be able, I mean, we've, we've applied it in certain contexts where there, there are these path dependencies. Um, and so, yes, you, you can do it. So the, the, really, I would say that the only challenge that you are presented with when you work with these kind of things is exactly how you're going to build these grid of points, which has to be in a way which is, uh, so that you end up with a small tensor in terms of the number of points on the grid, on the grid points, because that will uh, increase the computational gain but also do it in such a way that you're approximating what you want to approximate. If the function in question that you're approximating uh, is dependent on things that happen in the past, in the past, which is path dependent usually within a Monte Carlo simulation, you have to take that into account, so that can be done. Um, I see um, there's quite a few questions actually. So one of them is the, the, limit of, uh, the limit of number of principal components that can be used. Well, um, in, in principle, the sliding technique can be used for any dimensionality. There's no, in, in principle, there's no restriction to the dimensionality. But let's say in the example that I showed you uh, before, where we were dealing with swaptions that had 415 or so dimensions, and we reduced it down to 30. Let's say that you would have, let's say you would have wanted to keep 400 dimensions. Let's say, I mean, in principle, you can do it. Then the only issue is that the slider would probably have many more points that you would like to. But that's like there's nothing stopping you from doing it. Um, in any case, in practical terms, so far I haven't encountered a 
uh, dimension once you use PCA that you reduce it down to, where you've pretty much got rid of all the noise from the PCA, and there's a dimensionality that you wouldn't, in practice, be able to work with the sliders. I mean, usually when you go up to like 40, 50 dimensions, that basically kills everything, all the noise from the PCA, and you can build uh, sliders for 50 dimensions. So I, I would say that in, in practice, there's real, there's, I haven't seen the limitation of um, working with any number of principal components. Another question is, how do you define tensors? And what are the limitations of the Chevy Chev approximation? Well, I mean, how do you define tensors? Um, it, it was, if you go, to, maybe it was the part of the, maybe it was one of the slides where it wasn't, maybe the connection got lost, perhaps. At the beginning of the slides, at the beginning of the presentation, I think a slide, um, one of the first slides, where I introduce what um, tensors are. I'm going to put it there just for the benefit of who asked the question. It's a very simple thing. It's just a grid point with a value on them. Uh, this is how we define a tensor, and this is how we work with it, and related to it are the interpolants that we want to use. And the limitations of the Chevy-Chevy approximation, well, the, the limitations are when you go outside the, the bounds of what, where you have your results, which is when you start uh, working with really pathological functions and so on. I mean, for example, go, go to Trefelin's book. He, he's somebody who's interested in this theory just basically for the sake of it. All of his applications and his examples are very uh, pure, let's say. He, he doesn't really come up with applications outside of his own area. And of course, he tests these, uh, this theory a lot, coming up with really weird functions and so on. And of course, you can always come up with cook up functions. And I'm talking about mathematical functions where things are not going to apply, like it happens with every theory. In the case uh, that we're interested in, which is the application of these techniques within risk calculations, where we're dealing with pricing functions, uh, most pricing functions uh, behave really well, so uh, that's not really a concern. Now, the, one of the questions that also we've been getting is whether we've tried it with NMRF scenarios where only one risk factor is shifted for an unhedged portfolio. I haven't actually tried it myself, but I know that this could work really well because we're talking about only one dimensional situation where you can actually build very quickly your tensor and use barycentric, barycentric, barycentric interpolation formula in order to be able to get all the values that you need uh, in this setting. So I, I don't see, I, I think if anything, it should work quite well in this uh, situation. Well, thank you very much. And thank you all for joining.